Hey everyone, welcome back to the Active Towns channel. I'm John Zimmerman, and today I am super excited to have with me here in, at the Active Towns podcast and the Ecamm Studios, Jill Warren. Jill Warren is the CEO of the European Cyclist Federation. Jill, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. So, uh, Jill, uh, you and I have never met, <laughs> but we uh, were, were connected via social media and, uh, and and you were gracious enough to uh, to squeeze in this time. We're recording this on Monday, uh, May 2nd, and we literally scheduled this like a couple days ago. <laughs> and uh, the reason why we did that is we, you've got a couple of really, really important events that are coming up here in June, and we're going to focus in on those in a little bit. But why don't we do this? Why don't we just have you uh, real quick, uh, give the audience a little bit of an idea of uh, who Jill Warren is. Okay, thanks very much. So, hi, my name is Jill Warren. I am uh, the CEO, as you said, of the European Cyclists Federation, based here in Brussels. You can probably hear from my accent that I come from the U.S. So, I grew up there, but I have been in Europe since 1989, living in Germany, uh, Belgium, the U.K. Now in in Belgium again. And uh, I work for a fantastic organization that promotes cycling as a sustainable and healthy means of transport and leisure. So it's the perfect way to combine uh, my hobby and greatest passion with uh, my everyday work. That is fantastic. That is fantastic. And you were just on a vacation. You were you were visiting home in yes, the and, and upper Midwest. So uh, here you are. Uh, it, it looks like you you must have spent some time uh, visiting the uh, the Midtown Greenway here. And, and that, if I remember correctly, is right in the heart of Minneapolis. So you're, you must be from the Midwest then. That's right. I grew up near Chicago, but I've got family all over the Midwest, and I was visiting family in Minneapolis. And of course, I had to nerd out and see all of the great cycling infrastructure there and, and yep. go check it out for myself. That's great. That's great. Yeah. And and, uh, and again, I, I, I follow you on Twitter in, in addition to being connected on LinkedIn. So I was like seeing these images and I'm like, wait a minute, she's she's in the Midwest. She, it's like, and I'm like, where is she from? <laughs> so tell us a little bit of that story. How does, uh, you know, a girl from the Midwest uh, suddenly end up in Europe? Well, when I was in high school, I was an exchange student in Germany with a fantastic family. I had such a good time that I thought when I'm in college, I'll go back again and, and hopefully for a whole year, which I did. And my family very jokingly said before I left, um, just don't come back with the Germans. So I came back with a Dutchman. <laughs> and <laughs> You did not. I, I listened. I did. <laughs> and, and so we ended up settling in, in Germany at the time, but, but we've lived in, in other places in the meantime. And, and right now, Brussels is our home. Oh, that is too funny. Uh, so what year were you on that exchange? In 1989, so I 89. went just before okay. the Berlin Wall fell, which is a really exciting wow. time to, to be yeah. in Germany. Yeah, so I'm a 1983 uh, Rotary Exchange student to the Philippines. Okay, I was on a Rotary uh, a scholarship uh, yeah. for that year in, yeah. in Germany. So yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's 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 funny. But with small world and, and and all that, and and it really does. I mean, that's the whole reason why Rotary. And and I'm a former Rotarian too. Um, I didn't. Uh, I when I was living in the in the Hawaiian Islands, I was a member of the Rotary Club of uh, Kona on the Big Island. I was a Rotarian there, but I did not uh, uh, continue my Rotary membership when I moved to to Austin here about eight. Years years ago. But that's one of the, the main goals of Rotary is to be able to give that sort of international uh, exchange opportunity. And, and clearly it made a, a, a big impact on your life. Yeah, it, it changed my life. And so I'm eternally <laughs> grateful for having had the opportunity. Yeah, that's great. That's great. So uh, you, again, you had the opportunity to get back to the Midwest and kind of, you know, kick around a little bit and you were nerding out. And it's like most of the posts that I saw were all about bicycle paths and things of that nature. Um, do you make it back? to the United States uh, fairly frequently? I like to go at least once a year, but okay. this trip was the first time I had been since before the pandemic uh, because yeah, that yeah, made yeah. transatlantic travel really difficult. Yeah, yeah. When you look at, at North America and, you know, the, the kind of the challenges that, that we have, and, and I think it's well known what the challenges are in terms of trying to build out cycling infrastructure, uh, was there anything that surprised you on this visit, especially coming back after, you know, a few years and not being here? It did. I think that some of the cycling infrastructure was really state of the art in terms of, you know, separated, protected, two lane, 
lots of people using it. You know, clearly people had embraced this for commuting as well as, uh, you know, free time and, and things. I was very pleasantly surprised. Yeah. So not only by what I saw in the Minneapolis area, but for example, in Iowa, I saw a great cycle path that uh, you might have also seen my, my picture on Twitter there that, um, you know, 93 miles or something um, there outside of, of Des Moines that I thought, wow, this is really fantastic. Yeah, yeah. And many of those longer distance uh, uh, trails that are in place were most likely conversions of uh, railway corridors, which is, you know, because we had miles and miles and miles, tens of thousands of miles of trails that uh, or, or railway corridors that were sitting dormant. And so many cities took that opportunity to, to convert, you know, those those railway corridors to active trails. And so and, and what's great about that is that they tend to connect village to village and especially some of the smaller towns. And we'll talk a little bit about the, the Eurovela network as well, because there's a neat economic connection in terms of how you can bring some vibrancy to some smaller towns and villages and cities uh, by connecting it through, you know, the, those pathways. Um, let's let's pull up this slide here, which is, you know, really our landing slide. Uh, and, and since we've talked about Twitter a couple of times, you can see your Twitter handle right there in this uh, in, underneath your photo. And so you, you ended up after, you know, having some time, uh, you know, settling into into in, into the European area. Um, and were you in Germany most of the time or, or did you guys make it over to the Netherlands or, or have you skipped around a little bit throughout Europe? Yeah. So um, I lived a few years in Germany, then 10, 11 years in, in Brussels, then back in Germany for 11 years, okay. but working during that time in the UK. So oh, uh, wow. you know, going okay. back and forth every week. And my husband is Dutch, so I've spent quite a lot of time in the Netherlands as well, just uh, you know, for family reasons. And everything right. is relatively close together here it too. Sure is, yeah. So <laughs> the, the distance I covered in the states, you know, last week from Minneapolis to Des Moines to Kansas City, etc., yeah. you can do that here very easily, and then visit six countries in the process. So. Fantastic. Yeah. Great. Uh, and, and so you, you, you landed in what I would consider a dream job. <laughs> <laughs> How long have you been uh, with uh, uh, the European Cyclist Federation? Yeah, since the beginning of uh, 2020. So I started oh, wow. just before the pandemic. <laughs> yeah. Well, welcome to your new role. Here, yeah, here's exactly. a pandemic for you. Yeah, now be locked <laughs> down and work from home. So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and and are, so, you, do you reside right there in in in, uh, in Belgium? Then, yes, I live in Brussels, okay. and it's about a mm, ten minute bike ride from here to the office. Oh wow! Okay, fantastic. Um, I'm going to advance a little bit so we can uh, try to explain a little bit about uh, the federation. Um, why don't you go ahead and give a little bit of, of, of history to it? And, and obviously I've just pulled up a slide. So you, th yeah. can, that'll help well, in, in a nutshell. <laughs> in so a nutshell. We've, we've been around, we've been around for a while, almost uh, 40 years. We are the umbrella federation for the civil society cyclist organizations uh, throughout Europe. So we've got 70 members in 40 odd uh, European countries and as I mentioned at the beginning, we promote cycling as a sustainable and healthy means of transportation and uh, leisure. Um, I could say leisure. I guess that's how Americans pronounce it. My, uh, my English has become bad over the years. Um, but we, we very much want to do advocacy at the European level on behalf of our members. Um, but we also do global advocacy because um, some of what we do is also very relevant to a global context. Um, right. So not only in the context of the World Cycling Alliance, which we're a founding member of, but also in coalitions with others. And, you know, we, we take our advocacy all the way up to the COP26 and, and that kind of level as well. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad you mentioned that because we are going to we are going to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, COP26. Here's your your visions, uh, you know, for 2030. And boy, that sounds like it's a long ways away, but it's really not. <laughs> no, not not at all. And we have very ambitious goals. I mean, fun, when we set up this strategy about two years ago, we said, right, this decade, we want to increase cycling levels in Europe measured by the number of trips taken by at least 50%. Yeah. And on the way to vision zero, we want much safer cycling, which we define as reducing the rate of cyclists killed or seriously injured by at least 50%, also a very ambitious goal. When you look at, uh, you know, too many uh, deaths and injuries still happening on the roads, uh, we want stronger political support, which we define very clearly as cycling to be prioritized 
as a yeah. sustainable and healthy part of the mix. Um, we want massive investment, much more than is being done today. And, and so we think an additional 15 billion for EU funded uh, initiatives right. sounds about right. And if we're successful in all of that, we think that translates into around 100,000 kilometers of new cycling infrastructure in Europe. Fantastic, fantastic. And the, the challenges that we have, you mentioned COP26, uh, you know, mm-hmm. recently happened. And, you know, when we think of, of the challenges that we face, you know, some of those, those targets in that 2030 uh, overview of, of, of your objectives and your vision there, uh, you, you, some of them really are global in nature. So talk a little bit about what happened during COP26 and, uh, and how y'all sort of mobilized. Yeah, I, I think there's few people that would dispute. Well, I don't know. Maybe there's a lot of people that would dispute it. I don't know. But I think there's a lot of people on board with how urgent the climate crisis is and the fact that we really need to do much more to combat it. And we are of the opinion, as you would imagine, that cycling can be an excellent solution and that the potential uh, is there to, to exploit it much, much more in um, having cycling be one of the solutions to, to climate change. But when we got ready to go to the COP26, even though everyone who goes there is kind of with the program and signed up to the fact that we need to um, to, to have much more sustainable transport and, and, and further the cause of transport decarbonization, all of the conversations were about the electrification of vehicles. Right. And the transport declaration draft that was released in connection with the COP26 was only about the electrification of vehicles. And we thought, how can that be? Um, We agree that that is absolutely important and that it's crucial, but it cannot be the only solution to transport decarbonization. And so we thought, well, what can we do to raise a bit of um, awareness about this? So we put together a letter. Uh, We mobilized all of our members and allies uh, beyond uh, our own networks to to say, hey, sign on to this. Let's uh, call on government leaders to commit to boosting cycling levels to uh, achieve that transport decarbonization and to not only focus solely on the electrification of vehicles. And we were hoping for 60, 70 signatories. We thought that would look pretty good. Um, walking in there and and, uh, showing up with that. But it kind of took on a life of its own. And and by the end, uh, we got about 350 nonprofit organizations to to sign on to this and to proliferate this messaging. And this ended up helping alongside the activists outside the venue with all of their, you know, this machine flights, climate change uh, banners and, and everything to help encourage the negotiators for the European Commission to plead for a last minute change to the transport declaration that recognized the importance of active travel and wider system transformation to achieve transport decarbonization. So I think a very good result symbolically and and, and also in terms of awareness raising, but of course there's a, a much, much longer way to go. Yeah, yeah. Were you surprised when it, it it became obvious that they were not including cycling and, and active transportation in, in the narrative? Not necessarily surprised okay. because this happens a lot. I think that when you look at the forces that influence policy and you know the amount of money that's spent on lobbying and the influence that certain industries have, we are an absolute uh, you know, David consider, you know, compared yeah. to this Goliath, uh, if you like. So we have to work much, much harder to get our voices heard right. and taken seriously and considered. So it wasn't so much surprising that cycling was left out, but it was pleasantly surprising that, you know, we somehow got that mention of active travel back into it, which is a very nice thing to build on for the next uh, COP27 in Sharm el-Sheikh, Egypt later this year. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. Because th- that's right. The, the COP twenty six was actually twenty twenty one. Right. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Last November. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, I was I was blown away. I was baffled. I was frankly shocked and surprised that that uh, that active transportation was not included in there. And I was incredibly grateful that uh, that you all you know 
got the word out and, uh, and, and I made sure that, uh, on behalf of my nonprofit advocates for healthy communities, I, I made sure to, to sign on to that as well. Um, and uh, under the old active towns logo before I've rebranded and all that stuff, but it, it's out there, um, as well. So one of the things that I wanted to do was, was highlight, um, an event that's coming up here very, very soon. So on June 3rd uh, for World Bicycle Day, um, there's a special event happening. Talk a little bit about this particular event. And this is a free um, webinar type situation that folks can sign up for. I have. What's going on here? Yeah, thanks for mentioning that. So World Bicycle Day is a UN declared day that happens every year on June 3rd. They declared that for the first time in 2018. So it's been going for a few years now. And for us, that's a chance to really celebrate uh, cycling and, and bicycles. And the theme that we've picked out for this year to do some activities around is how will the bicycle shape our future, given the huge potential we see for the bicycle to shape our future. So we've invited some very prominent people to just have a conversation with us about that and give us their views on how the bicycle will shape our future at this event. So 90 minutes long, it's um, Central European time, 2.30 to 4 p.m., which would be, I guess, where you are, um, seven hours uh, early, uh, earlier. Yes, seven hours earlier in the day. So we, we deliberately put it in the afternoon so that our um, North and South American friends would, would be able to join us uh, this year if they're so inclined. So I do encourage you to sign up. We uh, have got some people from the sports cycling governance um, bodies, as well as WHO invited, the European Commission um, invited a, a couple of people who are pushing cycling policy in some major European capital cities. So I think at the end of the day, we'll have about nine or 10 people on the program who really have something interesting to say about how cycling can help shape the future from different points of view. And so I really hope you all want to join us. Yeah, fantastic. And I'll make sure that the uh, the links uh, so that people can sign up are in the show notes uh, in the in the video description down below. So mm -hmm. folks, be sure to uh, head on over there, uh, sign up. Yeah. I mean, what better way to, you know, wake up in the morning, get some coffee and, yeah. and, and, and you know, hear some folks talking about, uh, you know, the, the issues that are out there and the opportunities that are out there. So let's take a look at some more activities uh, that uh, ECF is involved with and uh, specifically uh we're looking at you know velo city is coming up and the euro velo program we're going to talk both uh, or a little bit more deeply about both of these um talk a little bit more about uh, some of these other activities that are that are listed on this slide here okay so the european cyclist federation obviously is an advocacy body uh, as i mentioned an, an umbrella organization for civil society cyclist federations uh, throughout europe we uh, practice evidence-based advocacy um, at the end of the day, and that means making sure that we can go to our advocacy targets armed with statistics, with facts, with everything that uh, would make the very compelling case for what we're asking them to do, uh, to have the policies and the budgets uh, and, um, frankly, change of attitudes to help further the cause of cycling. So that means that we produce things like reports. So you see on this slide that the benefits of cycling is one of our uh, most widely cited uh, reports that has lots of, of different statistics and facts in there about the, um, we've quantified in economic terms, all the different benefits that cycling brings. So that's a very good resource for anybody involved in this area and looking to, to have um, some good good facts and figures. Right. We also do things like uh, cyclists love trains. So the past year at European level was the European year of rail as declared by the European Commission. So we thought we would uh, evaluate how uh, bike friendly are Europe's long distance train services. So we evaluated around 70 long distance train services to see how easy it was or not to be able to take your bike with you if you wanted to have either a truly green holiday by taking your bike with you on the train or just in terms of commuting or, or however you might want to, uh, to to bring your bicycle with you. And uh, spoiler alert, there's a lot of room for improvement, even though <laughs> things are getting better here and there. Uh, that's something we'd like to see more of uh, coming up. And then 
Celebrating Cycling Cities was an event that we did last year, but it's very typical of the kind of events that we do where we bring very interesting folks together to talk about what's going on, what still needs to happen from a policy perspective and uh, what the challenges and opportunities are. And then Velo City is a fantastic event. It's our flagship event. It happens every year. Um, this year it will happen in Ljubljana from the 14th to the 17th of June. That's where about 1,500 uh, people involved in the policy and planning and promotion of cycling and active mobility come together. So we have everything from city planners to politicians to advocates um, that all descend on a city and uh, you know really make an impact over over four days in terms of knowledge exchange and 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 talking about what's what's working and and, and just really spreading the great ideas around about uh, how to increase and improve cycling. Yeah, yeah, and we'll talk about Euro Vela a little bit more in, in just a moment, and we'll we'll dive into that. But I want to stick with Vela City for for just a moment because this exemplifies what you were talking about earlier in terms of uh, a truly a global approach at doing this because Vela City has been around the world. In fact, it's been mm -hmm. in North America twice. Uh, both times in Canada. So uh, I, I guess I should probably lobby to, to uh, have, uh, uh, you know, the city of Austin, Texas, uh, you know, apply for uh, 2025. Well, that, well, that yes, we open. just released, we just released <laughs> the bidding documents for 2025. So uh, yeah, speak to us, we'll send them to you and, and you can put in a great bid. Yeah, yeah, I won't personally. Uh, <laughs> I, I stay out of that, but uh, I will, I, I definitely took note of it. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, so, so that is fascinating. This literally is, you know, 1500 people coming in from around the world world. Um, and, and, and this event is held annually now, correct? That's right. Yeah. Okay, yeah. We didn't have it in 2020 because of the pandemic, but right. 2021, it was back in reduced form in Lisbon right. last year, right. but now we're back in full swig and, and expecting a full house in, in yeah. Ljubljana in just a few weeks. Yeah. I was out there. I was looking at it. I was like, you know, <laughs> I would love come. to be able to do it. I would love to, uh, yeah decisions, decisions. But uh, for, for those in the audience, they know that I'm uh, seriously con considering coming uh, out for the International Cargo Bike uh, Festival that's the end of October. In Cologne. And, yeah. and, and oh, oh, so there's one in Cologne in June and then there's the right. The, yes, there's the, the one other in, one in the Netherlands. Yeah. yeah. And the Netherlands in, in, in October, the end of October. And so um, I'm seriously considering leading a delegation of folks who are interested in, uh, in cargo bikes and, and doing that. But now, oh gosh, if I if I could only afford to come to both. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I, I do want to, to linger just a little bit on on Velo City and, you know, some of the special stuff that happens during this particular event. Um, can you go a little deeper into what people can expect from this? Because I really do encourage uh, if you have the ability to, to get to this event, please do so. Yeah, absolutely. I think first and foremost, Velo City is a knowledge exchange platform. So having all of these brains and, and, you know, people doing great things in cycling coming together is so inspiring because over the four day conference, you can see so many different um, presentations about, uh, you know, things happening in cities and, um, you know, presentations by everything from the politicians to the civil servants working on this to academics who are doing research, very exciting research in this area to um, the, uh, you know, people um, doing everything from teaching children to cycle to um, organizing bicycles for refugees to anything you can think of that would help increase and improve cycling. So it can be, you know, very technical infrastructure uh, initiatives, you know, all the way to the more social um, side of things. So there's something in there for everybody in the different streams of, of uh, presentations that are there, as well as plenary sessions where we get very high level people to come, you know, at, at, you know, to, you know, from Lord Mayor level um, on up to uh, last year, we had the executive vice president of the European Commission, Franz Timmermann, speak at the event and, and say some exciting things about uh, cycling and, and what the European Commission still wanted to do to, to um, support that. So it, it's really a great place for all of that to come together. And I think everybody goes home with, with new ideas and great idea, you know, great things that they want to do and, uh, and plans. So it's, 
you know, it's certainly the highlight of our year. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, folks, if, uh, if, if you can't make it, but you'd like to sponsor and send me so that I can uh, do some interviews <laughs> over there, by all means, uh, yeah. uh, you know, the, the donate button is, uh, is on the website. <laughs> well, I, I should also mention that every Velo City um, has a bike parade. Yeah. And the bike parade is a highlight of the Velo City where you've got, you know, the 1500 people uh, plus, you know, locals and, and everyone you can think of all on bikes just taking over a city. And, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, Ah, gosh. Okay. All right. So let's, let's talk, uh, Euro Velo and, uh, w- what's going on with, with this particular mm-hmm. initiative. Yeah. So Euro Velo is one of the main activities of ECF. So we centrally coordinate the Euro Velo long distance cycle route network. So what is Euro Velo? It is a network of 17 long distance cycle routes that crisscross the entire continent each route has a theme. So I think your, your first slide, you, you um, were focused on the, the part of the webpage on the Rhine uh, cycle route. So mm-hmm. that, that's the Eurovelo 15, the Eurovelo 19 is along the Meuse River, the Eurovelo 6 is in part the Loire Valley and part the Danube. So several of them uh, do that. The Eurovelo 13 is pretty exciting. That's the Iron Curtain Trail, mm-hmm. which um, has, is being developed alongside the, well, where the former Iron Curtain was. And you've got the, the Med 8, so the Eurovelo 8 all along the Mediterranean, the Atlantic Coast Route, the Baltic. I mean, you know, I, I, you can tell I get really, really excited about this. I, I take at least one cycling holiday, if not multiple ones every year. And it's it's really fantastic. But it's, it's um, about 90,000 kilometers in total when it will be fully developed. It's just over halfway um, fully developed at the moment. And so we um, try to get together the funding, working with partners, you know, for further route development projects. And we run some long-term management arrangements to help market and and improve uh, the routes. And the routes, um, on the one hand, are are very much a cycling uh, tourism type uh, offer, but it's also used by locals in terms of commuting and for people on, you know, everyday journeys uh, as well as uh, in their free time Um, so it's a really fantastic uh, thing and it's very unique there's no other route network quite like this in a transnational sense uh, in the world yeah wow okay (laughs) and if you're wondering where my where my holiday will be this year i'm going from hook von holland in uh uh, in in rotterdam there Mm -hmm. and i'm taking the entire rhine down to basel switzerland so but, uh, you can you can find me there the last yeah. couple of weeks of July. <laughs> so I'm wondering if I can take the uh, Active Towns channel just you know just remote. I could I could just be you know on my Brompton just riding filming and what riding. a great idea. There you go. <laughs> so uh, let, let's talk a little bit about that because I think that it is important to acknowledge that ECF is is really quite holistic in their approach um in, in terms of cycling it's it's not just recreation it's not just sport it's not just utilitarian cycling it's all of it i mean you're incredibly supportive and agnostic in terms of type of cycling talk a little bit about that and why that is so important with the work that you're trying to do well i think it's important for a lot of reasons i think um Gosh, there's so much I can say here. I'll, I'll say a couple of things. First of all, what is the number one reason that people might not choose to cycle? And, and that's, do they feel safe doing it? So we need safe and comfortable cycling infrastructure that's well-connected. And Eurovelo is one way to have a backbone of, of networks that do that, for example. So our lobbying, on the one hand, for Eurovelo can help achieve that. On the other hand, our more general lobbying for a safe and comfortable cycling infrastructure, whether it's in an urban context or rural connectivity or what have you, can help um, produce these networks that people will feel comfortable cycling on and encourage to cycle more on. And once you and and, and the Eurovelo routes for some people can be like a gateway drug. You know, they enjoy doing that on the weekend or they've done it on a cycling holiday and then they think, wow, I just love the joy, the, the feeling I get from cycling, wouldn't it be great if I if my daily commute <laughs> was on a bicycle right. or that I do more things uh, or, or could I really live without a car? 
and and that might be where it starts for some people. Yeah. Yeah. And I really see, uh, you know, these longer routes. I mean, we started this off talking about some of the, the longer routes that you uh, were able to, to look at in the upper Midwest area and, and be able to appreciate that, you know, these are both uh, activity assets in terms of encouraging uh, recreation uh, cycling, um, but they're also key connectors for those local, uh, you know, environments. And, and you know, it, it's, it's, it's important to understand that whenever we build cycling infrastructure, as long as it's truly on all ages and abilities facility, it can serve all purposes. And, uh, and there shouldn't necessarily be that tension and conflict between, you know, the, the different types of riders. Uh, there may need to be some adjustment in behavior sometimes, but uh, for the most part, we're all kind of, we're part of the same tribe. Uh, you know, just yeah. well, wearing I think that's different right. costumes I sometimes. <laughs> really, yeah, and I, I had a nice example of that um, uh, not not too long ago, the mayor of Bratislava. So Bratislava uh, in Slovakia, near the Austrian border, you have two Eurovelo routes going through there. Mm -hmm. The 6, which is along the Danube, and the 13, which is the Iron Curtain Trail. And I would have thought just intuitively that um, about half or, or more was um, cycling tourists, because you see a lot of cycling tourists there. Right. Um, but, the, but the mayor of Bratislava told me, no, actually, it's about 70% local. Wow. Um, so okay. local cycling traffic on those routes, which really tells you that people are using these routes for everyday journeys um, for commuting, yeah. you know, as well as as maybe what they do on the weekend or, or just to go out and have a bike ride. Yeah. So and that's really great to hear. That's that's what we want. Yeah. So focus on building good infrastructure, all ages mm -hmm. and abilities, uh, infrastructure and routes that are truly uh, inviting to everybody and good stuff can happen. So as part of that, and in the spirit of that, um, I, I'm going to give our, our voices a little bit of a break here and we'll play a, a quick video here. Who are our city streets designed for? Shouldn't they be for all of us? How can we turn them into shared environments which help us make the most of urban life? Most urban main roads in Europe were designed with private cars in mind. Today, People are seeking greener, more livable, and less polluted cities. As mobility patterns change, while lifestyles and technologies evolve, streets must be adapted to the needs of today's cities. To tackle these challenges, let's rethink how we use our road space. The design of our streets should enable different road users to move with ease. This will create more breathable cities, where street space is shared safely and comfortably. But changing our streets is not just a technical issue. It's a political, social, and economic process involving each of us. New initiatives can support this transformation. Interactive projects, such as the EU-funded MORE project, help gather data, develop tools to model traffic flows and road user behavior, co-create road design together with citizens, and assess which options work best. More and more cities and their inhabitants are embracing the redistribution of road space as a way to create more livable environments. Together, we can reinvent the urban spaces we share. Together, we can make our cities more livable. Roadspace.eu Talk about a message that uh, is global. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, thank you for showing that. That's a really exciting project we're involved in uh, together with other partners uh, from around Europe. And it's really looking at how we can redistribute that space in a, in a fairer way that uh, enables much more uh, sustainable mobility in yeah. addition to, to private car travel. So, yeah. What I loved about that, too, is, you know, it, is it, it, it did feel like it was a very global neutral type of thing. I mean, oftentimes uh, North Americans will, will look towards Europe and go, oh, well, you know, they don't, it doesn't look anything like, uh, you know, North American. And, and I'm sure, you know, uh, folks from, from Australia and New Zealand are like, oh yeah, yeah, we can't even relate. That doesn't look anything like us. But what's great about this is that it acknowledges the fact that there's lots of work that needs to be done. And and many, many European cities, uh, it, it, just like cities around the world, um, you know, got 
carcentrified. You know, they basically yeah. got converted, uh, especially mm-hmm. post-World War II, into looking more like those diagrams were illustrating. And so um, uh, many of the same battles that uh, cities, you know, across North America and, and again, Aus- Australia, New Zealand, around the globe, these are the themes. So that, that's part of why this is so significant, because it's trying to, you know, and this goes right back to what we were talking about with COP26, is that these are the challenges that we need to address. Yeah, absolutely. You're, yeah. you're, you're absolutely right there. And I, I would even say, if, if I compare, you know, having lived in both places, and, and just recently it struck me again when I was over in the U.S., generally speaking, the road space in the U.S., you have much wider car lanes than than you have in Europe. So I would argue that you have even more space to be able to to redistribute (laughs) over in in the U.S. compared to what you have here. So uh, the potential is absolutely there. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, The the other fun little video that I'd like to show a video clip of uh, was uh, from a little more than a year ago. You could tell that there was a little bit of a, a of you know, sort of an influence of, of the pandemic, um, uh, in this particular video, but it's, it's a sweet little video. So I thought, um, it would be fun to, to play this as well and, and maybe riff off of the themes that, that are in, in this particular one, because I think it's, it was relevant to, uh, particularly your tenure since you arrived just before the pandemic. So let's press play on this the one The European too. Green Deal wants to slash transport emissions by 90% by 2050. With more cycling, Europe can achieve that objective. And Europe wants more cycling. Cities and countries have invested over 1 billion euro in cycling improvements since the beginning of the COVID crisis. They have designed 2,300 kilometers of infrastructure to promote active mobility. 67% of these funds were committed by only three countries, France, Italy, and Finland. But the true heroes of this story are cities. In a matter of weeks, amid a sanitary, social, and economic crisis raging all over the world, visionary mayors have repurposed vast amounts of their public space. New bicycle lanes are popping up all across Europe at an unprecedented rate. Sidewalks are widened to allow for more people to walk safely. Speed limits get reduced on hundreds of kilometers of European streets, and motorized vehicles are banned from entire portions of our cities. These cities have already implemented over 1,100 kilometers of new measures to make walking and cycling better and safer. It is almost as if European mayors were just waiting for an excuse to push cycling as much as possible. Thanks to this outstanding mobilization of resources, Europe is becoming a cycle superpower. But we are not there yet. Europe wants more cycling, and it needs the recovery and resilience funds to finance this revolution. The best moment to build a cycle lane was 40 years ago. The second best moment is now. And the, that, of course, is one of my favorite quotes ever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it, and in fact, I used that in a tweet uh, earlier today um, in regards to Delft. Uh, Chris and Melissa um, put a, a, a post out, you know, talking about the fact that in Delft, um, you know, the city center 20 years ago was overrun by cars. And so it was only 20 years ago that they started that process of taming down uh, the automobile in access to, to the city center. And so uh, my quote was literally paraphrasing and saying, yeah, the best time was 20 years ago. Uh, the second best time is now. We need to yeah, move and forward. It, it can go very quickly. Yeah. And I think what, what some people don't realize as well is it can be really, really easy and quick to repurpose streets for more active travel. So, you know, you don't have to necessarily build absolute state-of-the-art cycling infrastructure and, and have years of planning that goes into it and, and building it. But you can take a street that's right now used by cars and you can ban cars from it and you can say, right, uh, starting right now, this is a cycling street and there you have it. So we, we do have some examples like that from around Europe that are inspiring in terms of how to do something like that relatively quickly and cheaply. And right on cue, uh, <laughs> the first city that comes to mind is Paris. So let's, let's play this, uh, this uh, little 42 second uh, long video on uh, what's going on in Paris because it's super fun.
And uh, I, I won't play play the music on this. I'm just going to kind of uh, you know make some reflections and I invite you to do the same. Um, I was able to attend uh, the very first Car Free City in 2015 um, and be able to experience the Champs Elysees with no cars, and it just made all the difference in the world for the city. Talk a little bit about this experience that's happening in 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 Paris and reflect on just how important this is. Yeah, this is absolutely huge, what's happening in Paris. And it's been going on since Anne Hidalgo um, took up her post as mayor in 2014. So she pledged when she started in that role that she would build a thousand kilometers of cycle paths in, yeah. in Paris. And she's been progressively doing that ever since. And the pandemic was, as tragic as it was, also an opportunity to accelerate her plans. So, for example, the Saint-Martin Canal, um, she could make that car free earlier than I think was planned uh, in order Mm -hmm. to create more space for cycling during the pandemic. And over the years, I have gone to Paris a lot for work and and, uh, holidays and things. And the transformation that's happening before your very eyes is nothing short of phenomenal And it's been very well accepted by the population, too. I mean, anyone who says, oh, no, people will never accept that, wrong. I mean, during her re-election campaign in 2020, she announced that she was going to eliminate a further 60,000 car parking spaces in Paris. And she got re-elected anyway. (laughs) So, you know, people really do like what's happening there. Yeah, talk about a resounding uh, acknowledgement of, of the fact that when a leader make some bold statements. And I remember in 2015, leading up to the car free day, you know, one of her greatest quotes was, you know, hey, we're Paris and we can't even see the Eiffel Tower through the smog. We have a problem. Mm -hmm. You know, (laughs) the first step is acknowledging you have a problem. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And it's, um, wow. I I mean, I've I've been there several times in the past uh, two years and it's just, it's nothing short of phenomenal. I just can't say enough good things about it. It's really fantastic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One of the other things that I tweeted out uh, earlier today was about noise. And, uh, and that was the other thing that, uh, that I acknowledged when I was filming in the Champs-Élysées during the car free day. I went back the next day on Monday and filmed, I stood in the middle of the Champs-Élysées with car traffic going past me and just stood there and filmed and just captured the noise. Talk a little bit about that because noise pollution oftentimes gets lost in the conversation of the pollution that an auto centric design of cities, uh, you know, contributes to. It does. I think people underestimate how sick, uh, continuous noise pollution can make people. And we experienced during the lockdowns of the pandemic, for example, how quiet, the streets were, how quiet the air was without all of, all of the airplanes. And I just remember thinking how loud the birds were. I thought, oh my gosh, they're making a lot of racket. But isn't that a much nicer sound than, than all of the, the motorized <laughs> hey, vehicles? Hey, you know, down, kids. You know, come exactly. on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what a much nicer sound to, to wake up to and to hear all day. And, and, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Jill, What have we not talked about yet that uh, you think is really, really important for the audience to hear? I think this notion of prioritization is Mm -hmm. so important. I think we absolutely have to think in terms of hierarchies. So walking and cycling being the forms of transport that should be most prioritized, you know, then followed by public and shared transport and only then should we be prioritizing or, or indeed, uh, you know, considering the needs of individualized motorized transport? Because yeah. as long as we continue to, to do it the way we're doing today, which was the opposite of what I just said, then we're not going to have these livable streets and, and, and cities and nice places to live and meet the, the very urgent climate goals. We really just have to rethink and live a new kind of, of prioritization. And we see it happen in little pockets here and there, but so much more of it needs to happen. I, I would say that. And, yeah. and um, I, I think that's the most important thing that, uh, that I'd like to say, because it's just so important that, uh, to make any of this work. Yeah, yeah. So 
During the video that, you know, kind of reflected upon um, the changes that were happening within the cities and the various mayors activating during the pandemic, the height of the pandemic, and, and um, what's sort of in 2022, where are we at now? Or is, is that momentum continuing? Are we seeing uh, some positive, you know, results from those initial actions that took place? I mean, obviously you just mentioned uh, Paris, so we'll, we'll leave Paris out, but what else are you seeing, you know, across uh, your area of, of uh, concern and influence? I, I think that when we look at what cities were doing things or accelerating things during the pandemic, a couple of observations come to mind. Mm -hmm. So the first one is that those, well, it was surprising and encouraging to see that um, things were happening in favor of cycling in places not known as traditional everyday cycling right. countries and cities in Southern Europe, for example, in Rome, in Milan, in Barcelona, which, you know, had, had been trying to change things for a while. Uh, and in um, Portugal, for example, right. that was very encouraging to see. At the same time, um, those cities that already had plans in place were able to accelerate them because they already knew where those cycle paths should be. They already knew where they could build up the pop-up lanes and, and things like that. So that that was an important observation that if they already had done their advanced planning were on a, a good way, then, then you know they could take advantage of, of circumstances to, to do that. Um, have we, you know, what's, what's happened to all of these pop-up lanes? Well, the good news is that in a lot of places, um, they're being made permanent gradually. Okay. Um, but of course, some of them haven't. Some of them have gone back to, to what it was before. But it did give uh, advocates like uh, like ECF and our member organizations some very good evidence, a good body of evidence to say, right, you know, now we need the funding to make this permanent, right, uh, for right. example. And the video that you showed uh, showing what was what mayors uh, wanted and what, what was happening there was part of our lobbying efforts for the recovery and resilience uh, funding. So the European Union made 672.5 billion euros available for recovery and resilience plans. And the 27 EU member states had to all draft up their national plans. And so we lobbied very hard for cycling investments to be included in those. And 21 out of the 27 member states actually did Okay. include such investments. So some of the standout examples, Belgium included more than 400 million for cycle highways. Mm -hmm. Italy included more than 600 million for both touristic and, and urban um, cycling routes. Right. And Romania, over 100 million for uh, cycling tourism kind of projects and, and, and various other bits here and there. But in, in total, 1.7 billion, which I think is, is not too bad in terms of cycling funding that we hadn't been uh, see, we hadn't seen coming but before the pandemic so it's it's something to build on and to also make sure that that these plans are followed through on and, and that it encourages more investments like that also as more and more countries get serious about having national cycling strategies and plans that uh, are used as the basis for that so it's you know it, it, it rome wasn't built in a day all these cycle paths won't be built in a day either but uh it gives us a lot of hope and encouragement to keep fighting the good fight to to make sure that we have much more of this kind of infrastructure that will have more people on their bikes and and uh you know commuting and and uh you know doing their recreation in a much more healthy and sustainable way yeah yeah and i like to uh you know sort of uh, re-emphasize uh, time and again <laughs> that uh, the Netherlands experiences the very same thing. In the 1970s, uh, when you look at the before and after pictures, you'll see that the, the automobile started infiltrating after post-World War II into the Netherlands and they had, you know, car choked streets. And so, you know, it, they're just 50 years ahead of us in terms of, you know, where the things are there for, for them and and where these other cities around the country, around the world, excuse me, um, are wanting to do. So here's a question for you. What's a city or a, or a country even that's sort of a dark horse that would surprise us that, you know, in, you know, two, three, five years from now, people are going to be like, doing trips there to, to see because they're, they're a fast mover. What, what's your favorite one to, to bring up right now? This is really tricky because you have to see that things get followed through on. And Correct. sometimes you will see countries talking a big talk 
and then they don't walk the walk or they talk the big talk and they plan to walk the walk and then there's elections and then there's a different set of people in power who have different priorities. Right. So it, it, it's very difficult in that sense to have a crystal ball and say, this is the one to watch. But but I think France is, is the biggest country to watch right now in terms of stuff happening, not just in Paris, but also right. because of their national cycling strategy and plan things happening all over the the country in in various ways. I think that's the most exciting one to look at now. Ireland is the other one I would look at because since um, the government uh, came into power in 2020 there, um, the Greens are are in the government coalition and the coalition uh, explicitly stated that a priority would be placed on cycling and walking. And they devote 10% of their transport budget to cycling and another 10% to walking. And all of that adds up to a million euros a day for cycling and walking investments in that relatively small country. So right. we're seeing lots of projects come on board, and, and that's my other one to, to watch. I think Austria is pretty exciting, too, okay. with some of the stuff that they want to do there. They just had their um, cycling summit a few weeks ago where we heard some very exciting things being right. announced uh, there. So those are kind of my my three big tips for the moment. And then let's see what happens with the $600 million in cycling investments in Italy. Oh, wow. Yeah. 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 That's a good point. Um, well, no no pressure, Ireland. But, you know, we, we, we've <laughs> acknowledged this, you know, publicly. And, and so, uh, you know, let's get to it. <laughs> Build that out. Yeah. I'm not surprised with, with Austria. Uh, you know, Vienna has been one of rated uh, one of the most livable cities, uh, mm-hmm. you know, perennially year after year after year. Uh, you know, uh, Vienna has been on one of the top lists. I think it's Monocle that does, you know, some of the livability index uh, things. And I know that uh, transit is a big part of that, but it's wonderful to also hear that they're uh, looking at building out their active transportation um, you know, on the the cycling side as well. Yeah, I, I think so. Given that Vienna sits on the Danube, and the the Danube cycle path is is one of the most fantastic anywhere. Mm-hmm. Right. I, I think that in an urban context, they also want to do much more. And Vienna is a place I go to very often. Uh, oh, okay. Full, full disclosure: both of my daughters live there. They oh, they, fabulous. They both study there, so yeah. so I go there quite a bit and have seen the the improvements there. And and I think there's some. Very nice development. You know, I certainly noticed the difference when I was there. Also, I, I put this on Twitter a few weeks ago. They even have dedicated parking spaces for cargo bikes, which I love as a oh, cargo bike nice, owner. Nice. You, you don't find those everywhere. So yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that was one of my biggest regrets of, of my uh, month long uh, active towns tour in in Europe in 2015 was that I had fully intended to make my way all the way up to Vienna, and uh, just started running short of time because I. I ended the trip with that car free Sunday in, uh, in Paris. And so I was on my way to spend a week or so in, in Switzerland. And so the, the only part of, uh, Austria that I was able to visit was Innsbruck and because it was along the way, but, uh, so a future trip, a future Active Towns uh, tour and a f- future Active Towns profile will have to take place up in Vienna one of these days. Yeah. Uh, any final thoughts, Joe, before we uh, let you yes. go? Yes. One, one thing that I love yeah. to, to highlight is some of the most livable towns and cities we can all think of, whether yeah. you're in North America or in Europe, are university towns. Exactly. And why, why is that? Because by definition, you have thousands and thousands of people who are not reliant on cars, who have to get around by walking, by bike. And, you know, maybe the campus kind of situation um, facilitates that. But on the other hand, people love to live there, raise families there. They're considered particularly livable places. And I think so many cities of the world can take inspiration from the great university uh, towns and cities of the world. And that's something I would like to just leave out there as a thought. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I'm so glad you mentioned that too, because I've had the, the good fortune of being able to live in multiple uh, university towns, in, including uh, obviously when I was doing my graduate work at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, uh, you know, I've had you know the chance to visit multiple times, uh, you know, uh, Madison there in Wisconsin, currently mm-hmm. living in Austin, Texas, Texas, which is the University of Texas, and then previously lived in Boulder, where, uh, you know, the the University of Boulder or the University of Colorado is located. And you are absolutely right. There's that youth, there's that sense of of vibrancy that takes place. And there's so many great lessons that can be learned for any city 
town, village of, you know, thinking about how to embrace that sense of, of that, well, that culture of activity, that culture mm-hmm. of vibrancy that, that can take place. That's so wonderful. Jill, it has been an absolute pleasure chatting with you today. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you so much for organizing this relatively last minute. I'm so glad it worked out. Yeah. Hey, thank you all so much for watching this special episode with Jill Warren, the CEO of the European Cyclist Federation. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, be sure to leave a thumbs up and uh, leave a comment down below and uh, share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, I'd be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Uh, Just click on that link down below and uh, be sure to the notifications bell and select your notifications preferences. Thank you so much for joining me. And until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers.